Hello, welcome to this week's webinar that is part of the Copernicus MOOC. My name is Marta Bertrand and I will show you how to use the Wikio Ideas platform in your prototype development. First, I will explain what is Wikio. Then, I will show you how to register. By means of an example related to marine data, we will see how to access data. I will also introduce you on the possibilities to compute and transform data, with an example related to atmospheric data. Finally, I will Okay, I think we have a technical problem, so let's see what happened and can we start. I hope everybody hear me. Okay, I think we have a little bit of a bad start because we the webinar was not live, so we will start it again. So, like I said before, we will have today two parts uh, of this webinar. Uh, now I think it will be better for everybody if you hear me. So yeah, so sorry. Let's start from the beginning again. So first, we, you will have an um, introduction to Wikio by Marta Bertrand, uh, which will be followed by a Q&A session by Simon Smith, who is a director at, here at PwC Luxembourg. And for the second part, it's a prototyping presentation session by Susan Pronapellina, who is senior manager at PwC in France, also followed by a Q&A session. So don't hesitate to write your question in the chat during uh, each of the presentation. We will gather all your questions, collect them, and we will uh, ask uh, put them in during uh, on the screen during the Q and A session. Okay, so welcome everybody, and let's start again with Marta Batra. Hello, welcome to this Wikio webinar that is part of the Copernicus MOOC. My name is Marta Bertrand and I will show you how to use the Wikio Ideas platform in your prototype development. First, I will explain what is Wikio. Then, I will show you how to register. By means of an example related to marine data, we will see how to access data. I will also introduce you on the possibilities to compute and transform data, with an example related to atmospheric data. Finally, I will explain how you can contact us through the user support. Let's see what is Wikio. Wikio is a DS, that is, a data and information access service. There are five DS platform, platforms, and the focus in this webinar is on Wikio. Wikio is an European cloud platform where users can access Copernicus data for free and request processing resources to work with this data on the cloud. Wikio is being developed by three partners. UMITSAT, the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, ECMWF, the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, and Mercator Ocean which is a private non-company, non-profit company that describes, analyzes, and forecasts the state of the ocean. Let's see what you can do with Wikio. Wikio's offer is threefold. First, it is a single access point to open and free Copernicus data. Second, there are cloud-based processing resources and related tools. The third one is the user support that is based on the expertise from the three institutions that are developing Wikio. As you can see in this slide, with Wikio you can search and download data for free. The only paying services on the Wikio platform are the computing resources. Also, soon it will be possible to promote your business and services on the Wikio marketplace. To get started with Wikio, you need to register. As mentioned before, the registration at Wikio is free. There are two types of registration, the essential registration for the data access 
and the advanced registration for the access to the processing resources. As you can see here, the essential offer also includes Jupyter Notebooks. I will explain more details about it later. At the right part on top of the Wiki page, you can click on register. You will have to fill in a form with the following mandatory data, email address, username, password, in the subscription plan, you can select between Essential, Free or Advanced, Pay. You can first register for an Essential account and after some time, upgrade it as an Advanced account. Alternatively, you can directly register for an, for an Advanced account. Once you created your account, the next steps are to search and download data. I will first mention what are the advantages of accessing Copernicus data through Wikio and then I will provide an overview of the types of data available. One of the advantages of the data access in Wikio is that data is not a copy. At Wikio, you can access updated and timely Copernicus data directly from the original sources. Another advantage of Wikio is that it offers a harmonized data access. The Wikio's REST-based single protocol allows you to scale and evolve your code integrating all data sources. Wikio makes Copernicus data available for reanalysis, real-time analysis, and forecasts. In this slide, you can see an overview of the, of the types of data available at Wikio, classified in the following thematic areas. Climate, atmosphere, marine, and land. Here, there are only some examples, but I encourage you to check the Wikio catalog for more details about data. As mentioned before, the search for data at Wikio is free. This means that you can browse and find the data of your interest with an essential account. Let's learn how to access data in Wikio by means of a use case. A scuba diving company in the south, in the south of France would like to know which is the warmest beach in the Mediterranean coast of France. At Wikio, we can search, among others, a sea surface temperature dataset. The Wikio Data Viewer displays a map at the background. In order to search the data, click the button Add Layer. On the left, you can type the, you can type the data of interest in the free text search box, or you can use filters for an extended search. The results appear on the right. For the scuba diving class use case, we have found the dataset Mediterranean Sea, high resolution L4 sea surface temperature reprocessed. For its dataset, you can find a description, an identifier called dataset ID, and information about the time and space covered. Click the button Add to Map in order to access the data. A list of variables appears. We have clicked the Add to Map button to display them on the map of the viewer. Now, we are going to look at the steps needed to download data. As mentioned before, downloading Copernicus data from Wikio is free. In one of the selected variables, click the button to select the parameters of your interest. The map in the background of the screen can be used to select the geographical area. Our area of interest for the scuba diving use case is the Mediterranean coast of France. Regarding the temporal parameters, we have selected three years of data, from 2016 until 2018. Click the button Request Data on the Layers tab. Then, go to the Jobs layer and select in the Jobs tab and select the button Order. This will allow you to download your files locally in your computer. For this dataset, the downloaded data is in an etcdf file, that is a .nc extension. You might need additional GIS software to visualize it. In the screenshot, there is an example of the sea surface temperature for the selected area. In this case, the file was opened with Panoply.
Computation and transformation of data at Wikio can be done on our cloud infrastructure. To access your Wikio dashboard, you need to log in on your Wikio account. In this slide, you can see the dashboard for an advanced account, but the dashboard for an essential account is very similar. In this webinar, we will briefly introduce the sections Jupyter Hub and Virtual Machines. Let's see what are the options in the Jupyter Hub. The Jupyter Hub is offered uh, for free in Wikio Essential accounts and also in advanced accounts. As you can see in this slide, there is a Python Jupyter notebook with a step-by-step -step example. We are going to see now a different use case. A group of researchers would like to study the atmospheric data in the north of Germany for the past years. They can use Wikio to search for this kind of data. In this example, we will see how carbon monoxide CO data can be accessed. As explained before, you can search for a data set by adding a layer in the viewer. For this example, the Sentinel-5P platform has been selected. As we have seen before, there is a description for each data set. As we are interested in, C As we are interested in CO, we add to map the carbon monoxide data. We would like to use this data on the Jupyter Hub, so we click on Show API Request instead of the button Request Data. This option, Show API Request, allows you to get the code for this specific dataset that can be used in Jupyter Hub or in your virtual machines. The advantage of this functionality is that you do not need to download the data in your local computer. There are also virtual machines, VMs, available for computing and transforming the data, which are part of the paying services. There are several pricing options depending on the configuration you, are, you may need for your virtual machines. Configurations are different depending on the RAM, storage, and the number of CPUs needed. As you can see in this slide, there are several options for trial periods, which I really recommend for you to start using Wikio. You can access the virtual machines by clicking Virtual Machines on the Wikio dashboard. Alternatively, SSH access can be used to access your VM. In this slide, you can see an example of an advanced account in which the user has two different virtual machines, VM Test 1 and VM Test 2, with different operating systems. This webinar is only a short introduction to Wikio. We are going to see now more training options in case you are interested. As you can see here, there are several training resources that you can use to better understand and learn about Wikio with more detail. In the Wikio YouTube channel, there are training videos focused on specific to topics, such as ocean or climate, among others. You can also find Jupyter tutorials and other videos about Wikio topics in general. Additionally, in the Docs section of the website, there are several guides that you can read about the Wikio functionalities. Let's see now how you can contact the user support. You can interact with the, with the Wikio service desk for free. You can ask about everything related to the platform, offers available, data access, virtual machines on the cloud, once the user support team receives a message from a Wikio user, this request can be forwarded to Wikio's experts working at UMITSAT, ACMWF, or Mercator Ocean. There are two ways available for you to contact Wikio support. The first is to send a message through the web form, and the other one is by sending an email to support at wikio.eu. We hope we have convinced you to join us. You can find us on the Wikio web portal, wikio.eu, the Wikio Twitter account, and for any questions, do not hesitate to contact the service desk at support at wikio.eu. 
Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Um, very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Marta, for the introduction of uh, Wikio. Unfortunately, she cannot uh, today ask, um, uh, you cannot ask her directly questions, but uh, as she explained in her uh, presentation, you can send directly to Wikio questions, so I really encourage you to do it if you want to make use of it. Uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm a director of PricewaterhouseCoopers in Luxembourg, and I'm very pleased uh, about the number of people. It's even growing a bit up of 68 people, so thank you very, very much for joining this webinar. And we have also, uh, like usual, uh, but it's not usual for any kind of um, meeting. A very international um, uh, community here uh, from Europe, uh, at least, and there are probably there are more from Greece, Italy, Ukraine, Spain, Ireland, and Portugal. And we have people from the US, from Japan, from South America, Ecuador, Colombia, Panama, and from Africa, Senegal, Rwanda, and South Africa. So we have a very international uh, community here. It's really nice that you all joined uh, this webinar. Uh, before I start answering uh, your questions, I want to put a bit this uh, prototyping into perspective and explain you why we at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers and why you also should be interested in prototyping. And I hope you can see my screen now. Um, I will uh, share my share my screen. Yeah. So now you see a store. Now you see the finance by stage. There you see that um, basically the uh, the evolution of a company, a startup, goes from idea uh, to maturity through several stages, and the first uh, one is the idea phase. Uh, and when we go to validation, and validation is typically the area where Wikio can be very useful to see if your idea is uh, possible to realize through uh, Copernicus data. And you can also use uh, Wikio to a certain extent to start to prototype. Uh, later, you can even uh, launch your product uh, there or from one of the other dioceses, and then you get to grow the maturity. But why prototyping is such a crucial activity? Because it's very hard to uh, finance. So basically what you need is finance by a proof of concept fund or by a seed fund or uh, a business angel which is uh, willing to help you and some crowdfunding, if you do it uh, properly, they will also help you to get through this stage. And this is what we call normally from a business point of development, uh, valley of death, because it's so hard to get the finance done. So all the um, methods which we uh, are explaining and are available for prototyping are there to make prototyping as cost effective as possible, as cheap you can say, it's never gonna be cheap. The point is that you don't spend too much money and that you can already show what you want to achieve um, for a limited amount of money, which our business angels or proof of concept fund or crowdfunding is able uh, to provide. Now, after me, uh, Suzanne Frona will explain in detail about more methods about uh, prototyping. Uh, but now I'm willing to and able to take your questions about prototyping in general. So, Philippe, if you have selected any question for me. Yeah. Uh, question going on.
Ah, Simon, can you shortly summarize the process for us again? Yeah, that I do it again. No problem. Then I share the screen again. So, in summary, it means that any startup company has the first uh, idea, and this is basically going on all in your own head. And then you have to validate if this idea is um, is worth uh, pursuing. I mean, can you realize it's kind of feasibility? So that's what we call validation. If you then want to demonstrate that you can do it to others which could use your service or your product, then you uh, make a prototype. Uh, when you have this prototype, you could um, not only uh, demonstrate that it works, but you want also to learn the market so that you get your paying clients that is the launch phase uh, but it could be that you are only launching it for uh, for a limited amount of clients just be sure that uh, when the product is really uh, going into the market that is foolproof and that we call the growth phase and then uh, finally from growth you get to maturity and you are able to go uh, towards the market now, let's say uh, to explain a little bit more in this last part, there is enough money available uh, in Europe from the European Investment Bank or the EBRD uh, or through banks. There is not a problem for the growth phase. Also, venture capitalists, they are, they are very interested into finance growth phase. They don't, they are not very interested in uh, startup companies. They call it startup, but they're not really a startup uh, in the sense that you just starting. But that means they are calling startups the ones who have already been able to launch their product and are able to prove that they find clients with it. Uh, so in the launch phase, you need your launch a customer. So there you want to cooperate with other parties. And what we discussed today is uh, prototyping, which is the first glimpse of how the product could work or the service on the Internet could work in real time. Uh, what I didn't explain in the previous one is session is that um, in fact you want to ensure that when you set a up a startup that you uh, give everybody a fair share in your uh, company and that you do by uh, the slicing pie principle uh, and if you type it in on the internet you find uh, the book of uh, Mike Moyer who explains how you can uh, how you can do that but in the end for idea and validation uh, you have to be able to find the money yourself or what we call the, the four Fs, the friends, family and fools, or maybe buy a grant from a covenant uh, site. But as soon as you go to the from the validation phase to um, the prototyping, then you can uh, apply to proof of concept fund or uh, seed funds or uh, crowdfunding and uh, business angels. I hope that I have made it a little bit more clear. Next question, please. Can we compare prototyping to project design in a technical assistance uh, framework? Yes, uh, let's say in the technical assistance framework, if you follow the uh, standard procedure, then you do a project design, and this is in fact a, a, a prototyping work. Next question, please. Can you show us some successful ones you have worked on? Uh, basically, you are looking now to uh, one because the Copernicus uh, MOOC has been uh, created first as a prototype. And uh, I think a very good example is um, what Suzanne will show you in the presentation afterwards. This is on the um, farm sustainability tool, which is in fact um, going now through its uh, pilot. This is a European project for which um, we have been actively creating uh, the prototype, which is uh, Suzanne is going to explain to you later. And then uh, we are now working on um, 
on the launch of the product in the pilot phase. Next question, please. Why is the financing for prototyping so difficult to obtain? Uh, that's a very good question. The problem is that you need to convince somebody uh, that what you have been imagining, something which has not been created before, is, uh, is possible to create. Um, so many times uh, I've been myself part of juries uh, to listen to people who have only uh, a prototype, let's say, on, um, on a PowerPoint, nothing more, and, uh, and a very motivated team. And then they had to convince us that it could be really created. As long people in general, doesn't matter if you are an innovation expert or not, if you've not seen it, you start to doubt if that could be really created. But the people behind it, they have already made a calculation of this and they have imagined uh, something which they cannot demonstrate. So it is a matter of convincing people. Uh, that means that you have to have a very good convincing capabilities. And then you can find some people who are willing to take the risk. And this is the, the summary of the answer. Uh, the point is that the risk is still very high that you're not able to demonstrate it properly. So why should you put money into it when you have the risk that you lose it? Next question, please. I still not so sure about prototyping. Could you give me a super easy explanation? A uh, super uh, easy explanation is maybe, um, let me talk uh, about um, a paper clip. Yeah, if, if I show you, and that is maybe the easiest explanation. If I show you simply a piece of wire, yeah, I said, okay, look here, I have a piece of wire, yeah, and uh, now I have a way to work with this piece of wire, and with this piece of wire, I'm going to create something in which I can put paper together. Then you would say, come on, I mean, what can you do with a piece of wire? You can stick it through, or what do you want to do with it? Yeah, I cannot tell it because it's uh, up to... Uh, prototyping and I have to protect my idea still and I don't know um, uh, but the only thing I can uh, tell you the name of my uh, product it's called paperclip hmm. okay so if you have never seen this kind of thing you cannot imagine but if you prototype it you will create the very well-known paperclip, and we know that the paperclip is a big success, and then you e immediately understand what it is. But now it's a prototype, yeah? And even this prototype you can produce in a high amount, so it's a very successful prototype because there's very little uh, which should be done to um, uh, produce this in mass. So the, it is always a problem to convince somebody from scratch to uh, to be sure that, let's say, that you can really make a prototype out of it. I hope uh, that uh, to Akari I have to explain this. Next question, please. Great, so the MOOC was a brilliant idea. What were some of the issues you had to overcome to make it possible? Was PwC in from the start? Who had to do what? Thank you. Yes, PwC, we were in from the start. And our idea, and this we have realized, and it's also thanks to all of you that we have been able to realize it. We said in the beginning, we want to not to explain the technicalities of Copernicus because that had been done many, many times. We want to be sure that uh, the whole MOOC is drawn to the interest of the users of Copernicus. Uh, but it's easier to say than uh, to do. Uh, because what you then have to do, and this is with prototyping the same story always, you have to listen to the users. So what we did is uh, approaching organizations of users of uh, Earth's observation data, 
of uh, people who work uh, in uh, local communities um, who want to use uh, satellite data or they want to use satellite data for better air uh, conditions. And we have to listen to them and listen to what they need to understand to get going in Copernicus. So that's what we did. But then you get a wide range of difficult requirements, uh, which we had to fit into a program. And then the difficulty came, uh, what should we really uh, highlight in which way and which direction should we use to keep all these different uh, requirements interesting for everybody uh, who will uh, join us. And that uh, resulted, of course, in a prototype of our idea, and we wrote it down. And, um, and we tested this idea uh, with, a, with a group of users uh, to see if that kind of uh, approach would uh, fit for, uh, for purpose. Now we have uh, now we have a second edition uh, of the uh, book, and we have asked everybody uh, if there was any improvement necessary, and there were, and we have implemented in the second one. But I am very sure that uh, when we're going to ask you at the end of this MOOC again for uh, your feedback, that we will uh, make changes and we uh, will be able to make a next MOOC even uh, better drawn to your uh, interest. I hope that uh, it's a long answer, but I hope that I made it clear to you, John. Next question, please. Mm -hmm. A good time, good moment to ask it. Otherwise, we will continue our webinar. Very good. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, then we go to Suzanne, I guess, isn't it, Philip? Yes, thank you, Simon. No, Suzanne to join. So she... Hello, Suzanne. Hello, everyone. OK, I'm just going to grab my... OK, so... I'm delighted to be with you here tonight. And so thank you so much for joining. Uh, I just want to say a quick uh, shout out and thank you to the Competence Center for all the work that they put together to help uh, this MOOC be such a great success. And my uh, PwC colleagues, including Simon, that we've just heard from, thank you. That was such a great presentation. Um, and also for our uh, European Commission sponsors who, without without whom we wouldn't have this fantastic opportunity to share uh, information about the use of Copernicus data for new products and services. So um, in terms of my uh, presentation, um, what I'd like to cover with you today is I'm going to, um, there's a good question regarding what is, what is prototyping. So I'm actually going to cover a little bit of prototyping terminology. Also, um, a high-level overview of some different prototyping tools. And also, um, then I will go into an actual demonstration of uh, the prototype for the FAST platform, which is the um, farm sustainability tool that uh, Simon talked about and that was referred to during the uh, online portion of the MOOC. Okay. So in terms of uh, the prototyping terminology, I just created a, a few groupings um, because these are terms that we often hear and they are all uh, different ways of talking about prototyping. So the first one um, is the word prototype. And I think um, we're, the a physical um, a prototype is often a physical representation of the product that you uh, want your user to experience um, in a in a, a more physical way. I think one an example of a, a prototype that uh, not just from the field of um, software development, but even architects when they create a model of a building, uh, the prototype actually allows people to experience the building in a, in a way 
that um, they they couldn't if you just were to describe it, describe it to them. So um, that is kind of how we use the word prototype. The next um, type of prototype is is a mock-up. And a mock-up is usually something that has is is what we call lower fidelity. So it's something that's usually very um, simple uh, to or non-expensive to create. So an example would be, uh, it could be something as simple as a PowerPoint uh, slide that allows the users to interact with the product or service in a way that they can see uh, exactly what is um, involved in, in the prototype or the service that you're, you're modeling. The next type of prototype is a wireframe. And this uh, concept is usually linked to software uh, either web or mobile uh, applications. Um, so it's it's just another term that means uh, the same thing as as a prototype, and it's actually more of a technical approach to um, to designing the actual interface that the user will interact with. And then um, another example of a prototype is a storyboard. And the storyboard is more, um, uh, it's a set of, of illustrations or images that are uh, displayed in sequence. And it may include uh, aspects that are not part of your product or service, but are involved in the user journey uh, where the uh, different personas or the different users of your uh, end product or service, the sort of pathway they take to um, to interact with your product. So all of these um, term, terms can be used uh, interchangeably and they're all different types of, of prototyping with um, different degrees of sophistication or uh, specificities which allow you to uh, uh, test your idea with your target uh, user group. So, um, what I'd uh, like to cover uh, next is just a really short list of some prototyping tools. Um, I've just listed them here, and then I'm going to talk briefly about what they what they are and what you can do with them. Uh, this is by no means an exhaust exhaustive list, but it might give you the opportunity to uh, explore a little bit uh, some different types of tools and to see just what you can do with this kind of a tool set in terms of prototyping. So to, to help you to understand a little bit about uh, what is involved in using uh, these different tools, um, I think they can be divided up into this uh, complexity continuum, if you'll indulge me with that uh, terminology. Um, so in the first, um, oops, excuse me get my pointer back. In the first uh, circle here, we have tools that are more um, uh, used more in the ideation phase. Why? Generally because they're quite accessible and they're not very expensive um, and they're easy to use. So these are um, things like PowerPoint or different um, visualization tools. Uh, I included a tool called Mural, which has a lot of um, uh, it's a software tool uh, with maybe more um, a, li uh, a little more difficult than just these tools, that, these regular uh, end user tools that you're probably all familiar with. But um, it's also a tool that you can use to to ideate with. Then, if we go into sort of the next level, um, are the tools that are more involved, where you're actually showing. Um, allowing uh, an end user to interact with your um, your prototype. Uh, and these are tools like Balsamic or Figma, and they actually allow you to have a clickable um, uh, interactive prototype. Um, and then the last class of tools are the tools that are um, perhaps more difficult to ma master. And these are tools where uh, they might integrate um, sort of a whole test cycle, uh, allow different user login access. Uh, they might actually generate code uh, that can be used later to create the actual visual aspects of your final product or tool. 
um, and they usually have a somewhat uh, higher uh, learning curve uh, to familiarize yourself uh, with the tool. That being said, um, most of these tools have have many different features, uh, some of them uh, shared in common. And once you start to use one of these tools, you're you're going to develop a certain familiarity familiarity with how these tools work, and uh, you'll be, be get, become uh, more comfortable as um, as you use them. Okay, so that's just uh, a really high level um, example of. Uh, how how these different tools are um, could be classified. And now um, I'd like to go into um, an actual demonstration of uh, the prototype that was built for the FAST um, feasibility study for the nutrient um, management planning tool um, for the, the FAST platform. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So um, this is uh, the the first fast prototype that we did. Um, it was created in a um, in Figma. And this is actually uh, the prototype that we used um, after uh, we did our first um, our interviews of our um, uh, and, and development, uh, the interviews of our end users and uh, our stakeholders to understand the different personas. And we developed the different um, goals of the personas as uh, features that would allow users to get something done within the FAST platform. Uh, the users being primarily farmers who need to be able to create nutrient management plans in um, a, a, an easy and um, as user-friendly manner as possible. So um, we use this prototype to validate with the, uh, the sponsors of the program and the, the stakeholders on what should be included in FAST. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through uh, the, the actual um, interactivity of the prototype, but I just want to mention a few features in Figma that, that are quite nice. Um, so I'm, I'm actually in this uh, screen, I'm running the app, the, the prototype, and um, there's a this uh, little comment um, bubble here actually allowed us to uh, share this prototype uh, with the, the link to this prototype with our end users. And then we activated comments so they could come in and, and make comments while they were reviewing the prototype. Um, the other uh, sort of standard type of feature is uh, this ability to just generate the link so that you can share it with the number of people who, who will be have access to your prototype. And then some options for optimizing how the prototype appears on the screen. So as you can see, um, as I... Uh, I can click on this uh, prototype and it's showing me which areas are active so that we can take the user through the, through the screen. But um, it's actually uh, this, uh, the FAST platform was divided up into four areas. So the first area being the home screen. And in the home screen, uh, we had a, a sort of news feed, uh, a, a listing of all the nutrient management plans uh, that the farmer had created. Um, the weather uh, in their area, and also the mock-up of the Copernicus um, Sentinel uh, Earth observation data that is showing uh, the biomass index on the farm and the different parcels that the farmer has. And then um, uh, the next tab in the prototype shows all the farm uh, management areas the different parcels, the livestock that go into uh, potentially creating uh, manure as a source of fertilization, and then the areas that are um, uh, not part of the, um, the, the actual nutrient management plan, but are relative to uh, being able to understand uh, what part of the farm is um, cult being cultivated and what part is, is not being um, 
not exploited for uh, crop growth. And then this uh, part of the prototype is where the farmer can actually create a new plan. So as you can see, um, the user is given the option to compute their, uh, their nutrient management plan step by step. And these um, fields are uh, editable. So they have data that is coming from the member states uh, um, farm databases integrated uh, into the platform and then available for the farmer to either accept these default values or correct them and um, add any different sources of nutrients, et cetera, et cetera, and continue um, to develop the plan. As you can see, this really gives the user a real good um, understanding of what the app uh, could actually could actually do. And then um, in the, let's see, in the bottom, the other feature in uh, Figma in terms of the prototype is this uh, pagination feature, which allowed the user to go through every screen and we could validate um, our ideas with our uh, stakeholders and product owners to make sure that we, we were on the mark. And then the last part of the application had to do with additional products and services, which could be integrated and that the farmer could make um, take advantage of here. So as you can see, um, it's a it's a real live uh, uh, example of what the FAST could be. Uh, it really helps the user to understand. Um, it helps us to iterate on the features that should be included and to get uh, buy-in and um, uh, to proceed to the next step. So, so that's uh, an example of the, the actual tool um, that we should use a Figma used to create the FAST prototype. Another prototype uh, that we developed, um, tool that we developed in was, um, is called Balsamic. Uh, and this, this tool uh, is also a cloud. I should have mentioned that the uh, Figma tool is a web-based tool and so is Balsamic. So they're um, cloud-based and um, they allow multiple users to log in and use the environment to work. Um, so you might ask why, uh, why do we have this Balsamic prototype, uh, prototyping or wireframing tool, if you will. And this is because um, once we the feasibility study was done and we had user buy-in um, and sponsorship to continue into the pilot phase, as Simon uh, indicated, we started to get into the, the real nuts and bolts of what would actually be um, in the app and the more uh, detail level of uh, specification of what would be the elements on the screen, uh, what, um, you know, how would they be ordered, uh, how would the, uh, you know, what are the different widgets that should be there? So it's a different uh, approach. It's a, uh, it, in some respects, it's lower fidelity because it doesn't actually look like a, a, a mobile app. But uh, as you can tell, it's actually quite powerful and allows you to do um, uh, a lot of uh, um, thinking about how the application should be developed. Um, and it serves as, as a sort of blueprint. So I mentioned this in the webin, uh, I guess the um, the MOOC portion of prototyping, that um, yes, the prototype is uh, something that is um, something that you you use, but it doesn't actually necessarily mean it's the final solution. It's something um, that you have invested some time and energy in developing, but you're it, it isn't actually the working. Um, uh, system or your working s software solution or product. Uh, that being said, um, it really allows you to get a lot more, uh, to validate a lot more things than to jump right into uh, spending a lot of money developing a product and then finding out it's not what your what your users uh, are looking for. So uh, the prototyping process is super well uh, supported by these um, different level of capabilities in, the, in these different kinds of tools. So, um, so I'd like to go back just a little bit to, to Figma. 
So, um, and to show you some other features of the tool, which make it uh, quite powerful, and to show you uh, that even in the tool we iterated, um, and we started with uh, like the more, um, we started with our persona, so we had the, the cost conscious farmer. So this was someone who needed to be able to create a nutrient management plan that would also take into account their, his, his or her yield requirements for the farm. Um, the informed farmer who wanted to understand about their compliance with respect to the different um, uh, environmental um, components of uh, the common agricultural policy, the technology minimalist, that's the farmer who may not be uh, very um, comfortable with technology. So these are the different kinds of percent personas that we had to uh, develop, develop. And um, what was nice in this tool is we could uh, express them. We Figma gives you the op option to export this as a PDF. And um, so we used it uh, and to, to uh, validate um, the, the first uh, workflows or the first um, user stories and personas that uh, would be in the app. And then we continue to iterate. And in this part of the tool, you can see that we used it to really uh, explain, okay, what would happen in each part of the tool. And we, once again, we were able to publish this as a PDF and um, have our users uh, take time to pour over it and, and make sure that um, we were hitting the mark in terms of the conception of the, of the tool. Um, okay, so now that you've seen uh, some of the high, uh, high level capabilities of, of Figma, I'm gonna show you um, a little bit about the tool. So I'm actually logged in. This is the screen that you, uh, when you log in, you get taken to this landing page. Um, and uh, here, when you, when you first, um, what, what you can do to get an account at Figma is you just go to figma.com, you register, and um, I think there might be a validation step for your registration. And then the next time you come to Figma and you log in, you're going to have your actual uh, work work area. Um, what's really fantastic this is about this tool is it's an extremely powerful tool and it is 100% free for very small teams. Um, two editors, uh, two people can edit the uh Figma prototype, and you have unlimited people who can access your prototype. So it's an extremely, um, it, it's a great tool for uh, startups and for people who uh, want to have a really accessible uh, prototyping tool. So, um, so this uh, in this uh, sort of workspace view, you have um, there's some default templates. Um, but if you if you want to create a new uh, a new uh, prototype, you just click um, you click new here, and this takes you into the um, canvas where you can start um, you can start developing. Um, and so from here, uh, the first thing that you can do is you, um, you you have this sort of menu where you're accessing your different uh, the different capabilities in the tool. And I just clicked on this um, this frame tool, which opened up this context uh, sensitive menu on the right hand side, which shows you uh, different um, devices and the different form factors of each device. So for example, if I want to design for an iPhone 11, I don't have to know, uh, okay, how big should I make it? Will I be able to fit everything that I want to into this size screen? You just select it and um, you have the right form factor for your, um, your prototype. The other aspects um, that as you can see in this uh, sidebar, is um, this is the design palette. And then um, you can see that this in this tab, this is where you would construct your uh, live or your interactive prototype. And this inspect uh, tab is where you can see the, the code behind, in this case, the, co uh, the style sheets, which, give, um, which will guarantee a, a consistent look and feel um, for your app, uh, for your prototype. Um, Okay, so that's just a really uh, simple um, overview of the tool. 
Uh, this menu here um, shows uh, some, you have additional um, sub menus, but also I just wanted to draw your attention. Here I have an option, it's called Open in Desktop App. Um, that is because you can, um, when you first register, this will say uh, uh, Download Desktop App desktop app and that will allow you to also create um uh native uh apps that can run on uh, a desktop and by that um examples would be like a slack or a chat or um uh some sort of a, a prototype that actually would run on a user's machine and um and you can design uh in um, a desktop app, and you can also publish it into um, a another uh, device type like a mobile app. So it's extremely powerful, and all of this is free. It's just really an, an amazing tool. Okay. So um, just to give you an example of um, a simple app uh, that I created. Oops, I just got lost. Let me go back to the files. And I just created a really simple, um, uh, you know, this would be the example of the, maybe the background of the, of the phone. And I, I just created the first screen on the phone. So if I want to select the different parts of the app, I'm, I select the different layers here. Um, and uh, when I'm ready to run my prototype, I just click here. And there you have it's going to take a minute to refresh. You have the working prototype with all the same options that uh, I showed you uh, in the fast uh, in the fast prototype. Um, I think that's it uh, in terms of uh, the tool. I know it was a kind of a high level fast um, uh, overview. No, no pun intended. Uh, but I think um, that uh, with the different links in the presentation. And the things that you've hopefully learned in this uh, fantastic uh, Copernicus MOOC that uh, you're ready to um, get out there and try some uh, some prototyping uh, yourselves. So um, I guess I'll stop my screen share. And oh, you know what I did? I completely forgot to do questions, but that's okay. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I meant is I had a, a little survey and I, and I completely forgot to, uh, yeah, you, you have time. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, let's see. So, uh, of course I've lost my, uh, how to stop my screen share. So I'm not sure how to stop it. Terminate. Ah, easy. Okay. Good enough. Um, I guess I, I, I guess I'm just ready to open. I, my, I had an opening question, which I forgot to ask Benjamin to, to um, publish. Uh, I don't think it's, I, um, I don't know, Benjamin, can you still publish the survey before we uh, flip into question mode? Why not? Oh, it's me who has the hand on that. Sorry. I'm the one who forgot. <laughs> I'm blaming ben, Benjamin, but it's me. Let's just, I, I'm interested in um, just hearing from you. I should have done this uh, first, first off. But I'd like to know how many of you have actually participated in a project where a prototype was created and um, and what you feel like your level of experience is. Uh, OK, great. So we so we have a mix. Don't be shy. Nobody can see your individual answers. Okay, fantastic. So I think um, I think the level uh, I'm, I, I I hope I targeted the right level for you. And um, wait. A ah, okay. Okay. Uh, this means I'm gonna. Any last minute votes? Uh, any last minute participation before I close uh, voting? Okay. So so here we go. Um, Roughly uh, two thirds people uh, voted, and so great. So uh, not quite 50-50. I guess we have what is it? Uh, 26, 35 percent. Uh, 
of the population of today's population. So um, roughly half of those who voted uh, or a little bit less have, have some experience, but in the main uh, people are, are beginners. So um, really encourage you to uh, jump in and uh, thank you so much for uh, participating in that little vote. So I'd like to open at this point um, the floor to questions and I'll take your questions. Thank you, Susan. So we'll switch to the Q&A session mode. And yeah, we come with the first question. Ah. Um, okay, how long does it take man hours for prototyping for FAST? This is Dimitri. Um, I, I guess it would depend on um, which prototype we're talking about um, because uh, the first prototype that was done in the feasibility study, it actually, um, the prototype itself did not take very long. Uh, I'm just kind of uh, hazard a guess. It was, I mean, I actually have the exact numbers, but it's been a while, so I'm sort of forgetting. Also, our prototype, we actually connected our prototype um, we did the first pass, which was the visual aspects in Figma, but then we actually created a, a sort of a working prototype where we had, we were connected to Cop Copernicus data and um, we had a functioning prototype that actually um, uh, was deployed on um, one of the DS. But the Figma prototype that I just showed you um, to create that, that probably took us about, um, it, in terms of um, woman days, it was probably about a month. And I would say um, it started with maybe a week or two of um, the, the uh, setting the stage in terms of who are the personas, who are the stakeholders, what do they need to be able to do in the, um, in the application. So I would, you know, I want to say six weeks. Um, and, uh, but it, we, we continued to iterate on that all the way through the project, which lasted about, um, about eight months uh, in total. And at the end of the eight month uh, feasibility study, it was at almost a year, but in terms of, you know, there was some setup time and, and restitution time. Um, the, 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 the different prototype phases, I would say they were divided into like a month and a half for the, the Figma versions and then for the actual prototype that was running on the DS that was another th three three months and that was with um, you know and uh, three times uh, four uh, woman hours um, of months of time so honestly prototyping is um, it's a it's an art um, but the good thing up uh, and estimating is a, is a, is an art as well. But the good thing about it is you should really take an iterative approach. You should start with your first pass at your personas. You should start at what are the goals uh, of those personas. You should prototype those and show that to your stakeholders and then iterate. Next question. Thanks. Sorry. Um, ba, 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 the story behind it struggles and how you think you pressed it. What was the team size for this? Okay. Um, wow. I have to think back because we, we are now in the pilot phase. So for the, for the prototype, um, so, um, how, how was the thinking process developed and what was the team size? So the thinking process was really what I, I think I, I described, um, but, um, started with, um, you know, like what was the vision for the platform? Who are the principal stakeholders? Who were the um, product owners and the end users? Um, what are what were the principal personas and what did they need to be able to do in the application? And these things were all done in tools like mind maps, etc. Um, and um, and we had some good direction from our stakeholders in terms of they wanted it to be a user friendly web uh, mobile app and that it, it needed to be um, plugged into a backend that was running on a uh, one of the uh, 
uh, Europe, European DS, and that it was exploiting Copernicus data. So we had some good um, guidelines. Uh, we didn't we didn't have to come up with the idea ourselves. Um, and in terms of the team size, um, we had uh, probably uh, we had um, a technical project manager. We had um, a, like a, an agile expert, which is myself. We had some people who were doing more of the like um, uh, business um, analytic uh, things, like um, where were the algorithms? What uh, what are the um, uh, the the different data sets that need to be integrated into fast. So they were doing the sort of back uh, ground work to um, have all the technical underpinnings uh, necessary for the creation of the tool itself. So this was part of the feasibility study. Um, so we probably had three people there. We had two, uh, a technical and an agile, you know, coach. Then we had um, a, a, a UX person, a cloud expert, um, microservice and um, architecture expert, and um, an application development expert. Um, and so the team size was about seven people. I think I got there, two, five, six, seven, eight, uh, eight people, uh, not counting the product and the um, stakeholders. So next question. Thank you for that question. It's a good, great one. Um, for the Figma wireframe, so the question is um, how many iterations? Um, well, you, you could sort of see it in the PDF um, that I was showing. We started with the uh, just the personas. So that was the first iteration. Then we uh, the next iteration is what were the major tabs? Like what is it that you, how would we group functionality? So that was the next iteration. And then um, the third iteration, uh, we started with the simple um, user story, like login. Um, we did, you know, in the third iteration, we had some of the user, the simple user stories or the ones that we understood the process the most easily. Uh, that would have been the user story, the farm data, sorry, excuse me, login, the farm, accessing farm data, the communication feature, um, and that was maybe the third or fourth iteration. And then the, five, the fifth iteration was where we really um, came up with the more detailed workflow and we were ready to um, run, run the demo of the prototype against uh, um, with, our, with our end users. So that, that was something that went over about six weeks and there were about five iterations, four to five iterations there. So thank you. That's the next question, please. Uh, open source in terms of um, the prototyping tools, no, because the, the source code for, uh, I'm going to answer your question two, way, two ways, uh, Hugo. Um, in terms of the prototyping tools, there, none of these that I've shown are open source that I know of. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I uh, top of mind, I don't know of any uh, prototyping tools that are open source, but I know they exist. Um, I just can't think of think of anything. Um, the reason being that they're these two these are tools, so they're in a sense they're productivity tools, and so open source is we're not trying to create a prototype prototyping tool, so the open source aspect is not interesting uh, as interesting. However, if your question is more for the actual fast platform. Um, uh, almost all of the technology behind the uh, fast uh, prototype, the, the one that was after the prototype that we created in the um, Figma tool, but the actual prototype that we deployed into the DS, um, we everything is, is open source except for, um, well, open source in the sense that it's um, uh, free, open access, um, there, uh, there were, 
um, and, and exploitable under a, a GPL license, which I don't know what that stands for. The, actually, I'm probably using the wrong term, but um, one of the um, open source um, licensing frameworks, which allows uh, complete um, uh, appropriation of the source code and to, to use um, at, at, at will. Um, there is the algorithms in FAST are proprietary um, in some cases, um, not in the prototype, but in the in the current FAST, um, depending on the member state and the source of the uh, nutrient management planning um, algorithms. Some of them will actually be published as open source um, after validation. Um, but I, I would say 95 to 98% of the platform is, is open source. Um, I guess the parts that aren't open source is the fact that you're running on a DS, so you're, you're paying for um, a compute and bandwidth and, and things uh, in order to host the system. Uh, but the source code for the, app, the platform itself is, is um, you know, with very few exceptions, about 100% open source. And in fact, um, when uh, we are close to publishing the code on Git, um, so the, the source code for the FAST uh, platform will be published um, and, and anyone can, can uh, at, uh, um, do a Git pull of, the, of that source code and, and exploit it for their own purpose, use it for their own purposes. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, what should be minimum budget of projects so that, it, so that it is economically advantageous to use the tools that you have advised us so wisely to start from? Um, honestly, you can, you can, um, it's just a sweat capital in the beginning because anything that you have, uh, for example, Google, uh, Google Slides are, um, you know, if you have a, a Google account, it doesn't cost you anything to use the uh, Google Suite tools. So literally you wouldn't need any budget except for your, your sweat equity. Um, uh, honestly, I think budget questions are very difficult to, to answer because it really depends on the complexity of your product. Um, but I think uh, to, to, you should try to do everything free. <laughs> To begin with, uh, until you really have um, a validation of your um, your project, and by validation I mean um, end user traction, and I would even say someone should be willing to pay for your solution, um, because uh, pay payment means that they they feel like there's an exchange of value. They're willing to um, pay uh, to play and. Um, so you can you can start really small, um, and there are so many open source tools out there uh, for for starting uh, projects. You can go a long way with a very very small budget. But uh, honestly, I couldn't really even tell you the minimum budget. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's um, it really depends on the complexity. It depends on what kind of a project you're developing. Uh, you know, what are what is the the sensitivity of, of the kind of uh, manipulation you're doing. It really depends. So, uh, sorry, I wish I could be more precise. Um, but thanks for the question, great one. Um, are the terms prototype, feasibility, study, et cetera, interchangeable? No, I mean, um, feasibility study is uh, one of those sort of um, large initiative terms, which means, um, before we invest in um, something, we want to conduct a, a study to determine if it's feasible. So I think it's more of a, a framework for, um, for validation uh, that it's, it's a good question. I, I think it's a, a little more, you know, entre guillemets, um, academic, uh, maybe that's not even the right terminology for feas uh, feasibility, whereas um, prototype is, um, you know, I've got an idea and um, 
I'm, I'm testing the feasibility of my prototype. It might be, you might be testing or, or of my idea. So you might be testing the feasibility without it being a feasibility study because a feasibility study might also take into account, you know, um, resources available, um, maturity of the market, uh, um, you know, target population, uh, global economic factors. I mean, there, there could be all sorts of other components um, which uh, have, have uh, which describe the context of your project um, uh, in a feasibility study that are different than just a prototype and your product feasibility. So I hope I've answered your question. It's a good question. Aspen, thank you. Next question. I was the scrum master. Yes, my 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 background is um, I spent 20 years in New York. Sorry, I'm aging myself in New York City during the uh, the internet boom, um, working on um, uh, web uh, real time um, uh, advertising platforms. And uh, we did agile development. So we iterated, we did a continuous release and, um, and use agile, agile methodology. So that's where I got my start. And we used, uh, we used as much agile as was possible uh, in uh, the FAST study. Thanks for the question, Jean. Uh, well, I think, um, so I, I don't know that uh, we would, uh, so the question is, are there any examples of failed prototypes? Um, I think um, failed ideas, yes. Um, and, and to that extent, a prototype might be considered a success because it showed that the idea uh, was, was not able to, would not be able to gain traction. So, um, but I do think there are some examples of um, of of ideas where um, they were floated in one format. They were they were they were um, you know maybe maybe we released an initial prototype and then the uh, based on feedback we pivoted and we completely changed direction. Um, and I think there are a lot of examples of that in. Um, in the startup industry, um, for for whatever reason, nothing comes immediately to mind. But um, uh, so so y you can fail, um, but it doesn't mean that you you you've you failed for good. You've gained very important information, and it'll allow you to pivot and reorient for your next iteration. So, and that's really the value of a prototype: is uh, low fidelity, low cost. Um, quick cycles of validation and adjustment and um, uh, iteration. So I think that's a, that's a great question, Roko. Thank you. Next question. Uh, well, <laughs> the question is um, great idea for fast code. Um, it's a great base um, from which we can develop our own apps. Will PWC be available to help us in such dev? Um, uh, we do have, um, in our, uh, space practice, we are promoting, uh, this architecture. Um, and if you're interested, um, in, uh, a project, uh, where you would like to engage with PWC on your project, it's possible. Uh, we, we do, we, we are in, a, you know, a, a profit, um, organized, organized, uh, company. So, um, I, uh, we don't actually do free uh, free consulting, although we do um, um, we do have a, a, an arm uh, at uh, PwC where we are involved in um, associations. But uh, we we you know why don't you just contact me um, separately uh, through the 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 MOOC forum and uh, I can see it, you know, I can be more specific in my response to your, to your question. But I think, I think the most important thing would be to, um, to look at the, to um, look at the source code yourself. Um, and I would have to say it's not for the um, weak of heart because it's an, an, an extremely um, 
well-architected but highly complex uh, architecture. It's a cloud ar architecture distributed um, uh, application. So it's not for the, the weak-hearted. It, it, it um, requires an enormous amount of um, expertise but uh, expertise uh, can be found in the market and obviously PwC has that expertise. So get in touch, Jean, <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, is it possible to expand, expand the farm app on Ukraine territory? Um, the thing to do if you're interested in FAST is to con go to fastplatform.eu um, and uh, I think it's in my slide deck. Um, it's, it's, uh, the, if someone could type that into the chat, um, that would be great. Uh, and you, there's an expression of interest form, um, and you would contact one of the sponsors from the European commission to express interest in participation. Um, we, we actually, they were, they're planning a year two. Um, but I do not know what the cutoff is. I, I actually think the cutoff might already um, have passed, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, go and, um, and express interest uh, via fastplatform.eu and, uh, and get in touch with um, the, the organization uh, in terms of uh, the European Commission for the ongoing um, development for additional member states. Thank you, Anatoly. Uh, next question. Uh, hmm. Disaster management arena. Has Scrum Sprint ever been used in the disaster management arena? Well, um, that's quite interesting. I think um, Scrum is a, is a particular implementation of the Agile framework. And um, off the top of my head, um, I'm not sure Scrum would be the appropriate approach, but there are agile approach concepts that you could apply. Um, one would be the daily standup. And I think that you probably do a form of that already in disaster management with the daily standup. It's the 15 minutes that the cross-functional team meets to talk about what they did yesterday, what are their priorities for today, and what do they need help with? And then they can set up those um, uh, offline or uh, out of uh, stand-up meetings to go deeper into specific subjects. The other sort of um, agile uh, framework that I think could be applied to disaster management could be use of Kanban because Kanban is uh, predicated on having a backlog of things that need to be done, the things that are being that are selected for action the things that are um, being acted on, the things that need to be validated and the things that are stuck. And there's a notion of a uh, limit of work in progress. And that allows a uh, critical um, uh, workflows to be uh, prioritized and to be completed before moving, uh, before filling uh, in the um, active um, uh pipeline of, of activity. So there are agile, um, agile uh, concepts that could be applied to disaster management. Uh, Scrum is, a, is maybe a, a little too oriented toward software development, um, but there are definitely con agile concepts that could be applied. And um, I invite you to, to look, uh, to, you know, scour the web for, you know, the agile videos on YouTube, et cetera, and, and, um, and look and see, uh, educate yourself. Um, you can check, uh, Spotify has a very interesting, uh, implementation of agile. It's a, it's a variation on scrum. Um, there are a lot of interesting implementations, even if you, if you did, um, agile, a framework applied to disaster management, you might even find examples. A super question, a very interesting, um, very interesting one. Um, okay, interesting. So this person is saying, um, or oh, Gene, I don't know if it's the same person who asked the first question. I'm training disaster management using and launching it through Scrum. Each section as a user story worked brilliantly. Now they know disaster management and can run a 
disaster management project using Scrum. Wow, super, super interesting. I'd love to hear about your use case, um, Jean. I should, I should get in touch. Thank you. Um, hello, Susan. How can we use prototyping for research effectively? I guess prototyping is also effective for research, not only business and finance. Sure, absolutely. Um, let's say, um, I'm not sure what, it, you know, which area of research, but completely, you know, if you're, if you're, um, if you're trying to iterate on some sort of a, a solution or a study or a, um, I know we, we have data scientists in our um, team and we use a version of Agile for data science. Um, we use a Kanban approach and we iterate on the uh, different um, hypotheses that need to be tested um, uh, the, um, using uh, Agile. Um, honestly, I think um, these, frame, uh, these frameworks are very um, open uh, and very flexible. And prototyping, you could definitely use prototyping to uh, test some of your, your base assumptions um, in order to de-risk uh, your investment upfront. So uh, maybe choose the most, um, uh, the most critical um, um, path uh, in your research that needs to be de-risked or validated um, in other words, your base assumptions and try to break them down into bite-sized chunks and test um, and create prototypes of those of those items first. Uh, the other thing is to do is to pick the low hanging fruit. If you needed to get people uh, buy-in, you can pick something that's easy to do, easy to validate, easy to, um, to execute on. Uh, that's another approach that you could use. Um, choose a, a simple, um, use case in your research to prototype. Great question. Thank you, Akari. Uh, next question. So thank you, Suzanne. As you can see, it was the last question, but okay. uh, we, have, we have many thanks from the participant for your presentation and your Q&A session. So uh, yeah, it, um, we are even right on time. So it's, uh, oh, sorry, I think no, it's, uh, we, we had this one already. Um, okay, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Simon uh, and Martha also for this uh, great session today. Um, yeah, as usual, you can contact uh, through forums uh, on Moodle within the MOOCs if you have other question. And uh, yeah, I wish you, we wish you, uh, Copernicus team, a very nice evening or morning wherever you are cool. around the world. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for